I'm trying to do something that has never happened. But I'm not yet ready to give up because I think why? Why should an individual not be able to develop something and pass it on? Why should it be big organizations only that do this work? I met her in the, my third year at Rhodes University when I was doing my BSc and she came in and lectured us and I was absolutely amazed by this woman. She's an amazing extremely friendly, ext extremely approachable, extremely helpful. You know, she's just full of um, unrestricted enthusiasm. My mother's out there and she's doing so good and, you know, she gets more hits on Google than I do. So <laughs> I just feel like them, she's out there, she's some place I want to be, you know, she can, she's my inspiration to go further, you know. My life is a very, very long story and very confusing story, and I hope this time everybody gets it right. My father is South African, or was, I mean, he's late now. My mother is from Lesotho. So culturally, I was the first child. I've got to be born in my mother's place. So I was born in Lesotho for that reason. And then in those days, you know, you know I don't know whether you guys understand, you're too young to know, you had to touch your ear to go to school. Or you don't even know that. If you couldn't touch your ear yet, you're not ready. So I couldn't quite touch my ear for a while. And uh, also you had to be eight anyway, if you knew your, your, your date of birth properly. You had to be eight to go to school in the free state. The distances were extremely long uh, to go. So in the end, uh, my parents decided to move after the Shabdil massacre. They decided to move to Lesotho. But before then, for educational purposes, I was sent to my maternal grandparents in Lesotho. While I was there, I had to be a shepherd. I went to school on alternate days. In order for the society to make sure you are progressing well with your reading skills, your writing skills, we had to read in church. One in every four South Africans is affected by cancer. So we're looking at about 75,000 new cases each year of cancer. Cancer is ordinary cells that have gone mad. They have grown, they are growing uh, at a speed which is not normal for growth of cells. So they begin to make big, big ugly uh, blotches and then they affect the normal operation of the body and it is, it is really a very painful uh, process. There are a range of cancers, some not so well known and others more common. For example, with women, breast and cervical and colorectal cancers are the leading cancers. For men, it's prostate cancer, lung cancer, and also colorectal. I think that cancer research is at the absolute cutting edge. It offers a solution for certain types of cancer which has no side effects. And if you know anything about cancer, a lot of the treatments have really, really bad side effects. It's not because anybody in the family had cancer or anything like that, but I was interested in light. I, I'm, I'm interested in lasers. I'm interested in, in just using lasers for different applications. And then this became the more practical application. Then in combination with my molecules, the molecules we make in the lab, that became a wonderful thing to combine the two. My father was actually a very fascinating man. He made us work hard. You know, I can literally build a house. Because in the construction business, he would make us mix the cement. You know, he didn't want to pay the labor while we were there. Mix the cement, throw the bricks, sometimes climb. I, I, I can build a house. I, I plaster, a roof. I mean, my neighbors get so shocked when I climb and fix my roof. You know, I can see them running inside their houses. They don't want to see this. Yeah. <laughs> Upbringing is important. I was brought up like a boy, right from being a shepherd, right from building houses. I was brought up like a boy. I never thought of myself as a girl. I didn't. Yes, I had the plumbing system of a girl. I could have children like a girl. But I never thought anybody can be better than me because they're a boy. It never occurred to me. Seriously, I'm serious. We were not very well off, but we could afford a meal. 
but we only got dresses once a year. Yes, only on Christmas time, so my mother would get a, a big cloth and sew for us. As the oldest, um, occasionally I would get something, then I'll pass it on. I don't know, you guys don't pass, it, pass things on anymore. But we didn't feel poor in spirit. I, I, I don't think I can ever explain this. Because maybe, I, I don't know, you never felt poor because you had a dream. You could dream, I could be better, I could improve myself. My father had this principle after coming from Shabville that the system in South Africa would be beaten by education. So whether you held your book upside down, because I did that quite often to avoid doing dishes. For as long as you're holding the book, you didn't work in my family. Of course, my, my father will say, now you are studying, it's okay. <laughs> My father only went to school up to six and didn't dream of university at all, just wanted us to be above him. If you can get a high school diploma, fine. Her credo for a long time was, she has a PhD, the rest of us must do better. <laughs> Which is slightly difficult because I don't know what's higher than a PhD. But that's the kind of motto we all live towards. Photodynamic therapy is not new. It's not something that's all of a sudden emerged in South Africa or in Africa. It's been around for a while. What is new for us is the drugs that we are developing. I'll explain what photodynamic therapy is. Um, it is a treatment which involves injection of a patient. Like the patient goes into the hospital, imagine that, comes in, lies down in the bed, like they normally do, gets injected with a drug. Around the cancer cells, there's a lot of life. You know, it's, it's, um, the pH is different. There's a lot more nutrition. So these drugs seem to like that part of cancer. So they will accumulate there mainly. It doesn't mean they don't go to the rest of the body. Mainly, then what we do, we'll direct laser light to where the cancer is. These drugs, in addition to being involved in curing the cancer or whatever, they also fluoresce, they give us light. So you will know where the cancer is because they will give off light. So once they've given off light and, and you, can, you know exactly where they are, the laser light, what it does, it will, we call it excitation, it will make the molecules of the dye uh, get to a different stage. They, they, they absorb light, they become like excited teenagers you know, when after they absorb the light. And in the process of um, uh, absorbing that light, they transfer the energy. The drugs themselves do not really cure cancer, but they transfer the energy that they gain from the light to another molecule, the oxygen in the body. You know, we breathe in oxygen all the time. It's transferred to the muscles. It's transferred everywhere. They transfer to the oxygen in the body, and then the oxygen go from the, 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 the ground, normal oxygen we breathe, to a very toxic form of oxygen called singlet oxygen. And it is the one that will then eat, chew the cancer. Because we direct laser light directly to the cancer, and the oxygen will only kill that particular area. It doesn't destroy the healthy tissues. It's a directed form of treatment, unlike chemotherapy, which really kills indiscriminately. The drugs that were first used, I mean, they are marketed all over the world. They look like this. They are this. The problem with this drug is that it's, um, it doesn't absorb enough of the red light. We need red light. To, the red light goes through the body. But these molecules don't absorb red light very well. They absorb very weakly, meaning you must give the patient um, a larger dose than you would otherwise. And, and that is not good. Um, and, and secondly, they don't really stay very much in the cancer. They tend to also go into the surrounding tissue. That means that after the patient leaves the hospital, the healthy cells may also begin to die. So it, so it will begin to behave like chemotherapy. The way they are made is simple. You go to the aperture, 
or slaughterhouse, you get blood, you treat it with acids and bases, um, you, you filter it, you put it through some machines to just to make sure it's smooth and it has the same characteristics, and voila, you've got a drug like this. Then you sell it for 400 uh, euros per little bottle to South Africans. One of her main drivers that she always stress is that she wants to have um, cheap drugs for the South African community. And the base products that they use are much cheaper than the original photodynamic therapies that were based on blood um, compounds, which were much more expensive. And so their work is really aimed at seeing how cheap and easily they can make it in the end available to the local community. We'll then show you the drugs we are, we are developing. These ones absorb very strongly red light while these don't. But if you look at the color of these drugs, I don't know whether you're wearing jeans, anybody who's wearing jeans, these molecules are also used, but in a different form. You just modify it a little bit. They're also used as color for your jeans. Mm -hmm. And ballpoint pen, mm -hmm. they, they, they are also used there, but we've modif we modify them to suit ourselves. So this treatment is very good for um, cancers that are still in the beginning, not developed yet. And also it's good in, in co if you combine it with surgery. After you remove the cancer using surgery, instead of taking the patient through the whole chemotherapy thing, because that's the, the protocol at the moment. So this treatment, after, after surgery, then you, if you, for example, skin surgery, you just take one of this, you put it on there, you don't even need laser light, you just put ordinary light, we filter it so only red light goes. And you just say to a patient, just put your hand like this and go home. That's it. Lesotho High School was a prestigious school. They had the science branch. They actually physically separated. You had to either decide to go into sciences or decide to go into the arts. And who tells you where to go? Your peers. Science is hard, don't even try. You are going to fail. So I went with my peers and I listened to them. I had no other, no other role model, no other way of knowing what to do. I had to rely on them. So I went and did the arts for three years. When I was asked to write um, an essay, for example, 10 page essay. I'm sorry, in all due respect to all social sciences and artists out there, they can repeat the same thing over and over and over. Don't get to the point. And I could get to the point in half a paragraph and I would be asked to write 10 pages and I couldn't quite figure out why. So I began to realize my weakness. I, I can get to the point. I cannot go round and round. Then that's when Mrs. Madia, who is now late, one of my teachers, um, came into the picture and I just adored her. She was, she was a science teacher, she came from America, and I just decided, I think I'm going to try the sciences because of her. Because I, I really, really admired her style of teaching. She, she made science very easy, very enjoyable, sense of humor, you know, it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. 